uh, me on the front page of MIT saying, you know, they were surprised why would this Indian guy who's got all these degrees want to go back to India to study this ancient form of medicine. But what I discovered, this was a paper we recently published, was that Siddha and Ayurveda, the, all the terminology that's used, matches one-to-one -one with modern systems theory. So if you look at this, what you see here is, you've heard of the word input, right? Input and output into a system. If you think about a computer, you input stuff, you get output back. That's a system. You have transport of information. The CPU converts information. And, and the memory stores information, that's storage. If you look at all of these terms, they match one-to-one -one with our Siddha system. Karma actually is action, input. So this is a huge discovery we came up with. It's a breakthrough because what it shows is the entire system of Indian medicine has a core scientific foundation. And what we've done out of that, we've actually created a new educational company and, a, and an app where you, you can, it'll ask you a certain set of questions and it'll determine your prakriti or your natural system state, which is that red dot. Then I'll ask you a different set of questions and it will determine the black dot, which is your deviation. Very much like how these siddhas and yogis did. And then it will tell you particular foods you should eat, particular supplements you should take, very much like what my grandmother did. We've essentially created a way that we can help anyone understand this now. And we've put it into an educational institution called Systems Health. So for me, the two things we've taken the Siddha tradition of combination therapy, that has now come up with Cytosol. We've taken our Ayurvedic system and we've come up with Systems Health. Both of these are done basically to go back to the future. Okay, because if you start really looking at it, we India doesn't need to adopt GMOs. The modern healthcare system is very good after you get hurt, after you get in an accident, God forbid, right? After you get a disease, because most of the modern Western healthcare system came from war, after it was designed for killing people. The modern agricultural system actually came from pesticides, also designed for war. You see, our systems of innovation actually came from what? Healing. They were done to heal people. So we're at a very interesting point, and you as leaders can determine this, because do you blindly want to follow the Western leaders of innovation? Or do you want to look back into your own future? We don't need to look to the West. We just need to look about 300 years before. And you'll find the right models of innovation. Because at the end of the day, you may have heard this world called entrepreneur, right? I know Coimbatore is a rich center of entrepreneurialism. You had lots of small businesses. Where does this word come from? Anyone know? Where do you think the word comes from? Louder, anyone? You've heard the word, right? I think it was mentioned probably a hundred times in, in, the, in the Prime Minister's speech. Well, everyone typically thinks, once again, it comes from French. That's where they think it comes from. But let me tell you where it really comes from. It comes from Anta Prerana. It's a thousand years old. It comes from the Upanishads. Okay, and what this word means is it means driven by insight. And I'll read you one of the shlokas from it. It says, you are what your deep driving desire is. You are what your deep driving desire is. As your desire is, so is your will. As your will is, so is your deed. And as your deed is, so is your destiny. You see, this comes from our tradition. So if you go back to the future, you actually find out we have all the models of innovation. You know, we need to unbrainwash ourselves. You know, we can create innovation centers, we can put money in, you can have all your classes on innovation. But if you think that Bill Gates, Isaac Newton, Steve Jobs are your models of innovation and you forget that a 14-year-old boy invented email, that J.C. Bose invented radio, that Adia Bhatta did elliptical orbit, you're never going to innovate because you're going to not understand who you are. And we need to understand who we are because where we are is within ourselves. We can go within ourselves. We can go within to our own heritage. And that's where we're going to find innovation. That's where we're going to find entrepreneurialism.
So we need to go back to the future. Thank you. Sir, now we have a question round session for you. You sure? Okay. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. I'm Ms. Bell from First MIB. Put, put, the, put the microphone closer. I'm Ms. Bell from First MIB. My question to you is, first was me, then came email. So what do you think will be in the future? Oh, so the question is, what will be the future of email? Yeah. After email, what will be? Oh, good question. So first of all, so everyone understands where email came from now, right? It came from where? The inter-office mail system, right? So the inter-office mail system was what? For business use, right? Now you have to understand that many people have been saying email is going to die. You probably heard things about that, right? Email is dead. Since, 19, since 1978, people have said email is going to die. And I just wrote an article for the Wall Street Journal saying email, as long as there is businesses, there will be email. Now, why do I say that? Um, if you look at it, there are really three types of electronic communication or communication between humans. One is short messaging. If you go back to the history of short messaging, you know, there was a time when people beat drums, they did smoke signals. You remember sometimes you did little sticky notes? Do you know what I'm saying? Small index cards you, or Twitter or text messaging. That's in the history of short messaging. The second one is community messaging. If you go back to caveman times or cave women times, on big cave paintings, communities like all of us, if we were one tribe, we would put paint on our hands and then we'd put it up on the walls. That was really the face, first Facebook or handbook. Okay? That was community messaging. There's some part of humans which like to communicate through the community. Then we did bulletin boards. I'm sure you have bulletin boards here where you put notices. And that's today the blogs and the Facebook posts. You see, that's community messaging. But if you look at email, email comes from the origin of business communication. At times, many thousands of years ago, we had papyrus where we communicate commerce. And that became the letter. Right? That became email. So as long as there's businesses, there will be this process of email. So what, what got confusing is whenever people say, what's the future of email? First, you have to understand right now, we have actually these three streams of communication. Some of you may send, if you, if you have to work in a company, like a formal company, they're not going to allow you to chat back and forth. You're going to have to use email because it's legal, it's formal, it's business. You may chat with people. So text messaging, you may use for your friends, informal. And then you're going to use Facebook more for advertising and social media. So the point is that email is going to continue on its own path as a part of these other two medium. But what, what is going to happen to email is we're going to go back to the future with that also. Remember in the old days, the boss would sit here and he would dictate to the secretary? Well, what's happened now is we've all become secretaries. Before the secretary would do the sorting, the inbox, outbox, and do all the writing. Now we all do that. In fact, 35% of CEOs, they're on email. So one of the things I believe is going to happen is more and more artificial intelligence is going to get added to email. So you could talk to it. It'll write up a letter. It'll do more sorting for you. So you could spend less time on email. You could actually be the boss again. And the, and the email platform is going to become like the secretary. That's my prediction. Because that's going back to the future again. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Hi, sir. Sorry, from first time I be. My question to you is, from Mumbai to New Jersey, could you please differentiate the educational systems used in here? Yeah, so the question is, what is the educational uh, difference between Mumbai and New Jersey, yeah. right? Uh, you know, I get this question asked a lot, okay? And typically, I know the here. Here's a general answer, which has some truth to it. One one point is in the Indian system, you are taught in a very precise way, and you have to what they people call mug up stuff, right? Right. That's what I've heard, right? Um, and then the the thought is, well, in the U.S., you don't have to do that as much. 
And so, some part of that's true also. But the reality is this, both systems are actually getting somewhat similar. Let me explain what I mean. Whenever money gets involved in education and your entrance into universities as a function of money, both things start getting sort of polluted. So even in the US now, in the 70s or 80s, was the height of public school education. So I want to say this because you want to ma make sure you give credit to India too. You see, when my father went to college here, my father's knowledge, like he went to Anamala University, his concepts of mathematics, physics are phenomenal. So I believe there was a period in the Indian educational system where fundamentals were taught really, really well. I don't know what the situation is today, but I know in that time it was. And I still think in most Indian engineering colleges, fundamentals are taught quite well. In the US, what's happening is in the 70s, public school teachers were very dedicated. And they went all out. But what's happened in the US now is things have changed a lot. Public school teachers don't get paid anything. <laughs> you know, only the wealthy can afford tutors and consultants. So they'll also mug up stuff. So today, if you're a wealthy kid, there's a lot of dumb kids getting into smart colleges. And there's a lot of smart kids who don't get into college. Because their parents will hire tutors. They'll, in fact, get tutors to help them write their essays. Everything is a formula. So I would say that it's a very tough situation in the world right now. Because teachers do not get the respect that they do. So in, in, in Bombay, I think I was fortunate to have some good teachers. I know my parents were. Sometimes they were not. So really, it's not the educational system. It's how much you pay a teacher, frankly. So if you pay the teachers well, whether it's India or here, you're going to get a different educational system. In fact, I think I read in the newspaper that India is planning on really increasing the, the wage for teachers. I don't know if that's true. But fundamentally, I would say that at my time, I was very fortunate. You know, in India, as well as in the United States. But things are changing on the world right now. I hope that answers your question. You have a follow-up? Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Ronald from First MIB. My question to you is, at the age when everyone takes up sports, what inspired you to invent email? What, what's, so why did I... At the age where everyone takes up sports, oh, oh. what inspired you to invent email? Oh, so the question is, why, if, if, at, the, at an age when other people are playing, playing sports, why did I want to do email? Well, look, if, if uh, so let me ask you, do you think, I mean, I'm going to ask you, do you think there's a difference between an athlete and a, and a kid who likes to do math? Do you think that you can't be good? Do you think it's impossible to be a great athlete and to be a great mathematician? Also. Right? So so it's it's a good question you're asking because what's happened is, you know, I have I've noticed that people think, oh, you're good at this, therefore you cannot be good at this. Right? And so they put you into these little um, silos. Okay? Oh, you and in fact I noticed it in a company that I have a guy who'll do Java programming won't want to do C programming. <laughs> And he won't want to, you know what I'm saying? So part of one of the models of making you a good worker, remember the British wanted to make you good workers. Remember the caste system? You do this, you stay in that. You'll be a cobbler for the rest of your life. You're an athlete, you just be an athlete. You can't be a mathematician. When the reality is human beings can do many things. I mean, we're, we're not that different than gorillas, Okay. We have like one in a thousand different base pair differences. But among humans, there's not that much difference relatively. So part of what's the brainwashing that's happened is, oh, you can only do this and you can't do that. So the, the answer to your question is, I never thought it different. You know, I did play sports. In fact, I could have been a professional baseball player. I did play sports. I played soccer, baseball, and I invented email. And I burned flags on the steps of MIT. See what I'm saying? So... We need to realize that we should be renaissance people, okay? We're supposed to do many things. And when you start doing many things, your brain actually starts seeing connections. So the thing is, I never thought of myself, when others were doing it, why did I do email? Thank you, sir. Yeah, you're welcome. Good question. Sir, 
we have a rapid fire round for you, sir. Oh, okay. We request you to answer in a word or a line. All right. Is this what you do with everyone? Yes. <laughs> All right. You seem very good at this. Sir, if you could have an unlimited storage of one thing, what would it be? An unlimited storage? storage of what do you mean? Thing. Like uh, knowledge or you have uh, the messages, anything. Unlimited storage of one thing. Oh, oh, you're saying if I could store something. Yes. A one thing. Wow, that's a tough one. Hmm. Probably uh, uh, artwork, paintings, you know? Yeah. So what would you give more importance to? Medicine or media? Uh, the question is, what would I give more importance to? Medicine or media? Well, they're so closely linked, you know, so it doesn't matter. I'd probably take medicine. Yeah. So, tag yourself. Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, the Missile Man of India. Dr. V.A. Shiva Ayodhare is? The inventor of email. <laughs> React in one word to the following. Echo mail. Intelligent email analysis. Oh, one word? Uh, intelligence. Fran Drescher. What is that? Fran Drescher. Fran Drescher. Hilarious. <laughs> Google. Who? Google. Google. Uh, ubiquitous. Email. Uh, revolutionary. Wikipedia. Questionable. <laughs> Sir, what is your favorite tool of invention? What is my favorite tool of invention? I would have to say the pen. The pen, you know, writing. Sir, if you were to hack into someone's server, whose would it be? Hmm, that's a good one. <laughs> anyone server? Anyone I could hack into? Anyone. Well, that's a tough one. Do I have to answer that? Yes. <laughs> I would probably say, uh, I have to be the CIA. Yeah. Sir, is there someone's mail you're waiting for? If so, whose would it be? Oh, whose email would it be? Yeah. Suppose I said I'm not waiting. For <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say, oh, I, I would probably say yes. Can it be from an old person or someone alive right now? Anyone, sir. Oh, okay. I think it would be very interesting to get a, an email from someone like Augustia. You know, the guy who found her Siddha. Yeah. So, who would you like to exchange rules with for a day? For a day? Probably be an athlete. You know, probably be a baseball player or, or probably a baseball player. I don't know who, though. Sir, among all the movies and daily soaps done by Ma'am Frank Drescher, which one catches your eye? Uh, it has to be The Nanny. Yeah. You, have you seen it? How many people have seen The Nanny here? Anyone? I, I, yeah, because you've seen it. You're a little more westernized, huh? <laughs> Sir, can That's you good. tell where your birthplace is? Where it is? Bombay. Mumbai. Sir, so one line for GRD in Tamil. GRD in Tamil? Um, you're testing me now. Uh, you have to do one line or one sentence? One line, one line oh. or sentence. Rambanala University? Is that good? <laughs> <laughs> now, we have Viveka Priyadarshini to felicitate Sir with a memento. Okay. But that was tough. You guys are very Thank good. You. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. Uh, for the best tweet awards, uh, students can still keep tweeting for another uh, for another hour. Right. Uh, uh, sir would give away the best tweet award, and he will be choosing it. So the tweeting is open for another hour. Should tell the teacher. What we're going to do is, could you bring up that other image? You know, we are um, one of the things that on August thirtieth in Delhi, um, the Digital India Foundation is actually going to host a very special event. On call email at 33, where we're going to do a discussion about uh, the origin of email and what it means to the future and how Indians can help innovate it. But that image that you have of that 14 year old boy, we're actually making it some t shirts. So whoever has the best tweet will get a t shirt. So um, I'll be letting people know about that through Dr. Ram here. Thank you. We would like to thank you, sir for enlightening us on India innovation and inspiring the young GRDians. We would also like to thank our director who, for giving us this opportunity to witness the inventor of email and system scientist. We would also like to thank the organizers and the media team for their constant support. Last but not the least, to all you wonderful people here for being such a wonderful crowd. Thank you, sir. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Called the man who invented email. This was in November 11, 2011, that appeared in Time magazine. So when that came out, the Smithsonian, the Smithsonian Institution, is the biggest is the biggest museum in the world. They wanted all the materials. That's where Alexander Graham Bell's. Um, Telephone is, you know, Edison's light bulb is, and they wanted this as a part of that. So I agreed to give them all the materials, and this article appeared in the Washington Post. In the small video you did, that was the interview I was doing for the Post, and this article says, V.A. Shiva honored as the inventor of email by Smithsonian. Great honor, right? 35 years later. It's a great honor not only for me, but it's really for India. Because remember, I was an Indian citizen when I invented email. Okay, so it's actually Indian made. Now, you would think that everyone would be very happy about this, right? You guys are happy. But some people were not so happy. So all so right after this went into the newspaper, you saw all of this vitriol come out. Vitriol means anger. People call me an imposter. In fact, I want you to read this. Some of the language isn't good, but I want you to look at this. It basically says this curry stained Indian should be hanged and beaten. Okay? So this is in 2012. American, some of the people are so angry that an Indian could claim or have the facts that he invented email. So I'm looking at this now. I'm wondering what's going on. Why are people, you know, so upset? And you find out that there's an organization of historians called SIG CIS. See, in India we have corruption, right? Everyone knows about corruption? But what you don't know is that in America, the corruption is so deep. Any Indian politician is like a baby compared to an American politician. America thinks, presents itself as this very free, open country, but it's probably the most corrupt nation in the world. Okay? Its corruption is very deep. They pay scientists and historians to write history. This is a non-profit NGO group of historians who had written, already written the history that email was invented by this company called Raytheon. Now, Raytheon is a $50 billion defense company. All right? And what they had done while I was quietly doing other things, being a good, humble Indian, because that's what they train us to do, right? This company had created their own history using their propaganda machine, tens of millions of dollars in public relations, because remember, the, you know who Edward Snowden is, right? He brought out the fact the United States is spying on everyone. Well, in, in 2008-9, defense companies wanted to get into spying on everyone, so they created cybersecurity divisions. Raytheon wanted to get into that market, so they rebranded. I know uh, Rom here is a branding expert, so he'll appreciate this, right? 
So they wanted to rebrand their company, so they use the at logo. You see that? And they say that they're innovators. And they have a picture of a guy who looks like an inventor. He's got the nice dardy, the beard, and he's got glasses. And he had used the at symbol to exchange text messages. So they rebranded that as email. You following me? They rewrote history. When the term email never even existed in the early 1970s. If the Russians do this, Americans call it Stalinism. They call it revisionism. But when they do it, it's called history. All right? So that's what they did. Now, I, but you have to understand that I was able to figure this all out because I didn't tell you something about me. Not only am I a scientist and an inventor, but I'm also a student of history. And I've always been a fighter for others. Now, why do I say that? You see, a few years before this, I was appointed, you can read in the, you can read in the articles, in 2008, I came back to India after I finished my PhD to do, to do research on Siddha and Ayurveda, after I finished my PhD. And when I was finishing up my, uh, P, uh, my Fulbright research, I was appointed by the Prime Minister of India's office to run the Innovation Division of CSIR, Council of Scientific and Industrial Research. Now, if you remember, that symbol there is CSIR's logo. CSIR was sent up by Nehru in 1947 to really uh, support innovation in India, which means the idea was that we would create products that would help the Indian masses. Just take a glass of water here. So what that meant is that um, scientists would not just do simple papers and doing basic research, they would actually create products. So that's what CSIR was set up for. During those 70 years, CSIR had become essentially a organization which had a lot of patents, a lot of papers, but didn't really innovate anything. So, so in 2007 and 8, I think there was a lot of pressure on the Indian government. So I was brought in as an MIT guy who'd done companies, and they said, Shiva, why are you leaving? We'll give you, we'll make you an additional secretary in the Indian government, scientist level H. You report to the director general. So I decided to take on this role because I thought I could contribute back to India, to my what my grandparents had done, etc. So within about three months of being there, I wrote a report which really talked about how to improve Indian innovation. And I realized that throughout India, there were very uh, smart people. In fact, CSIR had 4,500 different scientists, 37 labs. And as I traveled all around India, I met with about 2,000 scientists. And I found out they had all amazing innovations. But their directors of their institutes were so afraid of their subordinates that they kept squashing them. Okay? So India, it's not Indians weren't able to innovate, but the leadership was very futile, just like the British. They'd essentially learned stuff from the British on how to keep people in a stratified way. So I ended up writing a report. My father-in-law at that time said, Shiva, just be quiet. You know, one day we'd be Minister of Science and Technology. Don't make any waves. But that's not who I am. So I wrote this report which said, look, if India wants to innovate, these are the things it needs to do. And within, I think, hours of releasing that report, I was fired. Okay? <laughs> this is Hindustan Times. And then you can, and then I gave a interview for Star News. I was told if I did this interview, I'd be thrown in jail. And at that moment, I thought about my grandparents. Because I realized that if I didn't say something, who would? You follow what I'm saying? I mean, how much more money do you need to make? How much more, you know, degrees do you want to have? So I gave this interview. It hit prime time. And then shortly thereafter, I took a train up to the Nepal border, crossed it, went to Kathmandu, Qatar, and I came home. All true. Sounds like a movie, right? When I landed in Boston, I had a email from Nature India's editor. Do you know Nature? Nature is the most eminent science magazine in the world. And they said, Dr. Iadere, we've been watching this organization for 70 years, and it hasn't produced anything. In fact, it produced $2 million in revenue from, from innovations over 70 years, which is only about 10 lakhs per year over 70 years. So I wrote an article which said, Innovation Demands Freedom. And I talked about what I'd observed, what India needs to do, and I said, I'll even have an open discussion. Uh, 
the article got published, the Prime Minister's office put pressure on the Nature India's editor, threatened her, and the article vanished. Now, P.M. Bhargava, who's one of the most eminent scientists in the Indian science organization, he wrote to Manmohan Singh and said, Shiva, you know, you should meet with Shiva. This is an excellent report. It's what India needs. And, and this is his um, article that he wrote uh, directly to the PM. Obviously, the prime minister never met with me. But you see, what I had learned was exposing what occurred at CSIR was not something I wanted to do, but I had to do. Because part of being a scientist, if you look at the great rishis of India, they were actually scientists, right? Science is not just about sitting in a lab and writing about something. It's about what? It's about truth. It's about the exposition of truth. 